This evening I'm going to cover what a software defined radio is, how the SDR technology is applied to HF radios that, that we've come to know and love, and talk about the, the different ways SDR is implemented in HF transceivers. And then I'm going to sort of give a more in-depth dive about our product offering uh, at Hobby PCB, the uh, RSHFIQ. Now, Wikipedia defines a software defined radio as a radio communication system where components that have been traditionally implemented in hardware are instead implemented by means of software on a personal computer or embedded system. And ARRL's definition says a software defined radio attempts to place much or most of the complex signal handling involved in communications receivers and transmitters into the digital DSP style. And it's, it's interesting, DSP is a word that we used to use an awful lot for digital processing. It stands for digital signal processing. And it's sort of the underlying technology that makes a software defined radio possible. Uh, it's based on the idea that if you can turn an analog signal into a sequence of numbers and perform mathematical calculations on those numbers, you can do the same things that uh, physical analog components do. And, and to sort of see where this all comes from, uh, let's take a look at a, uh, a classic superheterodyne double conversion uh, receiver. The, the idea of uh, mixing two signals together to get a, a, a third signal out was actually patented in 1901 by a gentleman named Fessenden. And the very first superhead receiver uh, was developed by Edwin Armstrong in 1918. So we're talking about 100 years ago. And it, this, this architecture dominated HF receivers uh, for at least 80 years. It's only really starting to trail off now. Uh, we'll start over at the left, where the, the, the signal from the antenna goes through an RF filter, or generally a bank of RF filters for multiband uh, equipment. Maybe some of the older ones had uh, tunable preselectors. And you'd have an RF amplifier, some RF processing there, and you'd use a local oscillator and mixer to mix the incoming signal to a fixed intermediate frequency. And the first intermediate frequency was generally a pretty high frequency so that the receiver would have good image rejection. Um, and you'd have, a, you'd have a filter that wasn't particularly narrow band. Uh, it was certainly wide enough to cover any of the modulation types in the radio. Then you'd have maybe some gain at the first IF, and then a second converter uh, consisting of a mixer and a local oscillator that it converted to a lower frequency IF. And the, at the lower frequency, it was easier to implement narrow band filters for CW sideband AM. Uh, and then you would have additional gain, maybe some automatic gain control applied at this stage. And then a demodulator for the various modulation types to uh, recover the audio from the RF signal, an audio amplifier, and a speaker. Uh, when we first got digital signal processing technology, uh, nobody thought it was going to be the entire receiver, so we just called it DSP. And we applied it right here, right at the output of the receiver. And we were able to do things like noise reduction, uh, automatic notch filtering, some audio filtering that really improved, maybe didn't, didn't improve a high performance receiver, but for a basic entry level receiver that maybe only had a single sideband filter, uh, it, it was a significant performance uh, enhancement to add DSP to the uh, audio. And some transceivers did have uh, DSP in, at, the, at the audio stage. Uh, products that were based on this technology were like the time wave filters that uh, had various filter settings for sideband and CW uh, and were, were very popular to enhance the performance of receivers. Another product, actually Radio Shack made a product called the DSP40. Uh, that did auto notch and some other CW enhancements. Then as processors got faster and uh, D to A converters got, uh, got more proficient, we sort of slide the DSP processing over to the left a little bit. And we put it right after the bank of narrow band filters. 
And these filters got a new name. They got called roofing filters. And they're the, they sort of set the analog bandwidth right before the digital signal processing. But at this stage, the digital signal processor could add in additional filters. Uh, they could do filter shapes uh, with variable skirt widths. They could add in uh, all of the demodulation functions. So now, uh, receivers that used to be just sideband and CW, all of a sudden, are, everything's all mode because it's only software to add uh, different modes and different functions. And this sort of architecture is what's called a hybrid SDR, where they maintain a lot of the analog front end uh, and add the, the digital portion of the radio where it's, where it's super convenient to add functions and, and demodulation. And some products based on this are the uh, ICOM 756 Pro. That's a classic example of a hybrid SDR. And the Elecraft K3, uh, also a, a high performance analog front end followed by a top notch digital processor. Sort of gives you the, the, the best of both available worlds. Uh, but data converters didn't stop there. They got much, much faster. Processing elements uh, became not so much uh, software like on a PC, they came up with hardware elements to do incredibly high speed signal processing and they're called field programmable gate arrays and they have logic cells that are made to do things like FFTs and uh, filters and, and all sorts of things. And this allows us to slide our digital processing even further to the left to right after the RF filter. And this type of a SDR is called direct sampling because the, the RF is directly sampled and processed entirely in the digital domain. And this means that if we have enough processing, we don't just have to have, we're not limited to one receiver. We might be able to do five receivers and uh, spectrum scopes and send out chunks of the uh, RF spectrum on, uh, on the ethernet for processing somewhere else. Uh, there's really a lot that can be done with this type of architecture. And we're actually starting to see ham radio commercial products uh, based on direct sampling. The ICOM 7300 is an excellent example. Uh, very high performance radio at, at just a sort of a medium radio cost, uh, which does direct digital uh, direct sampling SDR technology. And of course, the Flex 6000 series radios uh, they uh, do direct sampling and still do an awful lot of processing on the PC uh, and display and rig control. Uh, but all of this processing sort of is just recreating the old superhead in the digital domain. Uh, less so the direct processors, they, they, they can use just about any process they want. But there was a, another receiver architecture that wasn't really used or never, never made it to mainstream in the analog world, but it's found new legs in the, uh, the digital signal or the uh, software-defined radio world. And that is the direct conversion receiver. Um, the block diagram of the direct conversion receiver is much easier. It's a, uh, a single local oscillator with a mixer, low pass filter, and an amplifier. And as far as I could find, the only real uh, commercial product based on a direct conversion receiver I found was the Heathkit HW7. Um, there's lots of uh, project type kits and, and low cost radios that uh, you can find back in the back at QST. And ARL seems to at least every year publish a, a design where you can build your own uh, direct conversion receiver. And it's good, they're, they're low cost, they're easy to build, uh, you've got good chance of duplicating it correctly if you try to build it. Uh, the limitation is they're really only limited to CW. And that's because signal, single signal reception is, isn't really possible. Uh, because when you, th there's no differentiation between the upper sideband and the lower sideband when you mix like this. So if you keep your bandwidth really narrow on your low pass filter and there's only one CW signal you're trying to listen to that's in that bandwidth, it works okay, but if you're trying to listen to a single sideband signal and you've got lots of other single sideband signals two and three kilohertz away, uh, it, does, it doesn't work so well. But in the SDR realm, 
we actually <laughs> implement two direct conversion receivers, one of which is in phase, or it is done with a zero degree LO, and the second is with quadrature, or an, an LO that's 90 degree out of phase. And how we do that is we, we filter the R, or use an RF filter from the antenna, we split it into two equal signals, and then we use a specially designed LO that drives two mixers at exactly the same frequency with a local oscillator that's 90 degrees out of phase. And then out of the mixer, we low pass it to sort of set our bandwidths. And we're even using a, a, a mixer developed by Dan Taylor. And how that works is we use a, uh, an, instead of conventional sine wave for the local oscillator, we use a digital signal, a square wave, running at four times the operating frequency. And we divide it down digitally, and we actually end up with all four phases, 0, 90, 180, and 270. And we feed the 0 and 90 to analog switches, which perform the mixing function. Uh, and, and that gives us a really, really high performance, low cost uh, uh, mixing scheme. But I'm going to walk through a little bit of how I and Q actually yields a signal that gets rid of the image rejection. So let's look at a chunk of spectrum uh, from 7.09 to 7.11, 20, 20 kilohertz, and we'll put 7.1 right in the middle. Now I'm going to add sort of an amplitude scale to it, and it's kind of like a spectrum analyzer. And we'll add in a signal right at 7102. Um, now, if I, if I mix this with a 7.1 megahertz oscillator uh, and, of course, zero degree phase, what we get out of that mixer is right at DC. Zero, kil uh, zero kilohertz is right in the center of our spectrum, and our signal at 7102 now appears at, at 2 kilohertz. But unfortunately, that's not all. Uh, we also get a signal at minus 2 kilohertz because what comes out of the mixer is the sum and difference of the two signals. And if you just plug a headset into this and try to listen to it, uh, you can't really detect that there's actually two signals that you're listening to because they both appear to be at exactly the same frequency um, and exactly the same phase. So what we do is if, if we take the, the baseband is just the same here, but I've now added a sort of a Z axis, a, a third axis, which shows the phase of these signals in the baseband. And if I slowly vary the phase of the signal that I'm mixing, you'll see that one of the signals increases in phase and the other decreases a little in phase. And as anyone who's ever tuned a single sideband receiver knows, the upper sideband tunes in the opposite direction of the lower sideband. So if I give it a little bit more in phase increase, maybe 45 degrees, you can see they're, they're separating further. And when I get to 90, I get the unique situation where one of the signals is at plus 90 degrees and the other signal is at minus 90 degrees. And now if I take the output of that and shift the entire spectrum by 90 degrees, I end up with a spectrum that looks like this. I've converted by 90 back to zero degrees and my minus 90 is now at minus 180 degrees, which makes it really convenient to add back to our original signal, which had two signals at zero degrees. And if I add them together, the image, the unwanted signal, cancels, and the signal that I do want gets 6 dB larger. And that is, uh, that's sort of how the IQ receiver works. Now, there were analog implementations of this. They called this the phasing method of, uh, of decoding and encoding single sideband. Uh, but it was, it was difficult to implement. And even a, a slightly off in the phase change, the image rejection was really, really poor. But when we do it in the digital domain, uh, we can get incredible image rejections out of it. So if we, if we take our uh, INQ TALO detector uh, direct conversion receiver and we get an audio codec, which is a, a, a coder and decoder, generally digital, it would be, you might find it in a laptop to do the sound. Uh, you might find it as a USB device that plugs into a laptop. 
And these are generally two-channel, high-performance uh, A to D and D to A converters. The, the one that's here is 96 kilosamples per second and uh, 24 bits of resolution. And we can take the output of our, uh, our converter and plug it into the right and left inputs of the, uh, of the A to D converter. And then we can take the resulting digital stream, bring it into a computer, and use software to recover audio, do filtering, all of the standard SDR functions. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be a unit. This could all be done at the chip level uh, with a, a codec chip and a digital signal processor. And if you do that, you get the Alicraft KX2 and KX3. They have virtually exactly the same architecture. Uh, they add some preamps and switchable attenuators and things in the front end. Uh, but that's what their down converter looks like. And then they run a uh, high performance D to A chip, uh, DSP, and they've implemented it in sort of a traditional radio style. But don't let that fool you. That is an, that is an SDR that you're, you're looking at right there. Another example of this is the Flex 1500. Again, exactly the same RF hardware down to the chip that's driving the LO. Uh, they have the ADD converter built in. Uh, they connect to the PC with USB and a lot of the signal processing is done on the uh, on the PC itself. At the other end of the spectrum, there's these little things called soft rocks, and I'm going to talk about them more in depth later. But it's a uh, it's a uh, sort of the minimalist implementation of of uh, this technology, uh, which got you some really high performance for incredibly low cost. And then our product, which is called the RSHFIQ, which I'm also going to talk about uh, in more depth later. Um, and it's, it's uh, basically an enhanced soft rock and, and has, has those things. Now, my next slide is going to cover some of the software it's possible to use, but now might be a good time for the uh, uh, raffle ticket break if the raffle tickets have arrived.